They launched in 2012, three co-founders, now 105 people, helping hotels and specifically hotel locations better optimize their pricing. They raised $51 million, serving over 3,000 individual hotel locations, paying on average 17 grand per year. So they will very soon be doing about a $50 million run rate, 75% gross margin, which they've really like tripled uh, over the recent future, which is incredible how they how they work that fixed cost structure to drive more growth and, and bring the margin up over time. Uh, additionally, again, spending about 20,000 bucks on CAC, so super healthy payback period about well, healthy payback period at about 14 months again based out there in san francisco and vegas this is episode 737 coming up tomorrow morning i talked with mariano the question is is he the future of design collaboration well folks 1200 customers are paying him and three million dollars every year my answer would be yes what's yours but first here's today's episode this is the top where I interview entrepreneurs who are number one or number two in their industry in terms of revenue or customer base. You'll learn how much revenue they're making, what their marketing funnel looks like, and how many customers they have. I'm now at $20,000 per talk. Five and six million. He is hell bent on global domination. We just broke our 100,000 unit soul mark. And I'm your host, Nathan Latka. Hello, everybody. My guest is Patrick Bosworth. He's the co-founder and CEO of a company called Duetto Research, which and his focus really is driving vision and growth at the company. He has nearly two decades of experience as a leader in the hospitality, technology, nonprofit, and government sectors. He also holds an MBA from Harvard. Patrick, are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah. All right. Is your MBA, from, is your MBA from Harvard worth anything in the startup world or no? Yeah, I don't think the company would exist without it. Um, Tell me why. Well, so the company was started through a section mate of mine convincing me that there was an opportunity to build a tech business here. And then he introduced me to one of my co-founders, Craig Weissman, who was the chief technology officer of Salesforce.com at the time and was looking to found his own business. And um, and then in the fundraising process, uh, you know, it's – whether it's the just way the world should run or not, um, it definitely created a lot more credibility that, you know, I had an MBA from Harvard, uh, another co-founder had an MBA basically from Cornell, and my third co-founder, you know, also went to Harvard. And those networks are very strong, and it helps you get meetings with uh, venture capitalists. Um, and that's that's how we raised our first round. For a young student listening right now that doesn't want to go through the work of actually completing a degree at Harvard but sees the value in the network like you do, is there a way to hack that? Is there a way to get access to that network without actually you know going through classes for four or five years? Um, I, yeah, there are. Um, I, I, I think that you do get other benefits other than just the network by, by going through, I did the two year program, so it wasn't a four or five year commitment. Um, but, uh, so in particularly in my case where I was going from a non-traditional background, having worked in the arts as an actor and singer to then working in politics, um, it was really helpful for me to have a, a grounding in business terminology, the way businesses work, meet a lot of you know, people that had worked in banking and consulting and other things that had a lot to teach me, um, aside from just the network. There is a there are abbreviated programs. So there are things like the executive education program, the advanced management program, and other short short courses that you can take that give you access to the network. Mm -hmm. So if that's the the primary interest. Now they tend to be expensive. So it's like sixty or seventy. I think it's like sixty or seventy grand. I mean, don't quote me, I don't know the pricing, but it's I think it's like seventy thousand dollars to go through an abbreviated program that then gives you full access to the alumni database. You can put it on your LinkedIn and, and start kind of networking in that circle. Maybe that's what I'll do. I'll raise a VC fund and all I will do is write a hundred grand checks to smart people to go through the program so they can get access to the network with a guarantee that I get 5% of whatever company they create coming out the other side. <laughs> uh, <I don't> know. <laughs> Patrick, tell me, tell me more about Duetto. What do you guys do and what's your business model? How do you make money? Um, we are a hotel software company. Um, we leverage what I would refer to as medium data, not really true big data, but large data sets to um, help hotel um, managers at the property level make smarter decisions about their business. Like and what? So, so our first product is pricing optimization. So um, we pull in a bunch of different signals of demand at the market level and for that particular hotel and help them pick the right price for each customer segment, each channel, each room type um, for every day for the next 13 months. Um, and in general, that increases their revenue by 
anywhere from six and a half to eight and a half percent, which increases their profit by 75 to 100 mm-hmm. percent. What is the I mean, how do you make money on this? Is it a software as a service product or you're taking a cut of revenue rise you generate or what? Most of it is uh, just a subscription uh, payment that's paid annually um, that's based on the product that they're buying and the number of rooms in the hotel. Interesting. Um, we do have a performance kicker that allows us to get a share of the upside um, and helps align our, our risk with the client. Surprisingly, hotel companies typically want that to be a small part of the deal. Well, of course. Uh, I, so why, wait, why is that surprising to you? That's what I would have guessed. Uh, well, I think I, I thought, particularly in the earlier stages of our company when we weren't as proven, I would have expected them to want us to take on more of the risk and then make money more on the upside. But because of the fragmented nature of the hotel industry, where you have a separate party that owns the the property, another one that manages it, and then another brand that could be on the you know on the outside of the building, um, getting alignment among those three parties can be pretty complicated. And what they want is to know what their expenses are going to be and have a, a fixed price contract. Mm-hmm. And so anytime we try to do a more variable contract, a pricing negotiation that might take one to two weeks would drag on for months. one to two or three months. And uh, and so they wanted to limit the risk. But having some of our fee at risk does give them the confidence that we're willing to kind of um, put our own uh, livelihood and, you know, behind their success. Last month, what, what percentage of your revenue came from just the flat SaaS model versus the, up, you know, hey, we got a percentage of the upside we created model? I'm not certain, but I'm guessing it's about 5%. From the variable. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, this definitely is like 80, 20, even, even more sharply at like 95, five, something like that. Yeah. It may have been seven or 8%, but no more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So take us, uh, take us back. Well, actually help us understand kind of averages here. So I imagine you have all kinds of cohorts of different customers that you're selling to. Who are you actually selling to though? Is it the person that owns the building? Is it the Marriott that operates the building? Is like, who are you? Who's the buyer? It varies. Um, so if it is a strong brand like Marriott, who's not a customer of ours currently, they control all of their brand systems and we would need to integrate into their ecosystem of inventory management, distribution, and so on. And they would then have complete control. So if a real estate owner wants to work with us at a Marriott property, um, Marriott would, would prevent that because we're not integrated into their ecosystem today. Um, so in the case of a very strong brand like that, we have to go to the brand. In the case of smaller brands that maybe don't exert as much control or have more of a membership model, um, or when it's more of just like an independent hotel in a market, um, then it can be more of the management company, the people that are actually hiring the employees and operating them. But what a lot of people don't realize about the hotel industry today, though, is that a lot of times the brand is no longer the operator. They've, they've gone so asset light that they no longer, not only do they not own the, the underlying real estate, they also don't actually hire the employees that service the guests. Got it. Um, and so those management companies tend to be our first point of contact and our ultimate champion to then get alignment from the brand and from the real estate owner to make a purchase of our software. And give me a sense of the general size of that, right? So on average, are they paying 30 grand for the year, 300 grand for the year? What's a range? So on a per property basis, I think today we're getting about 17 or $18,000 per hotel per year. Got it. Um, so and that, that, and that depends on the, the number of rooms. Of number of rooms and the product that they're buying. Got it. Okay, take us back more to, to the backstory here. So what year did you guys launch this company in? We founded it in February of 2012. Okay, 2012. And you say we, there was two other co-founders? That's correct. Okay. And how did you guys have the equity conversation, right? There's always lessons in that. Between the three of us? Yeah. I mean, mo- some people will say, oh, we just put it 33, 33, 33. And I say, You're, that's weak. Somebody's worth more than somebody else. You just didn't want to have the tough conversation. How did you guys have the conversation? Um, we certainly had the tough conversation. Um, so, you know, Marco and I... We're working on this business. We hadn't founded it yet. We hadn't created the actual entity, but Marco and I have been working on it for about a year. Um, and we met Craig Weissman. Uh, let's, I think we met him the beginning of September of 2011. And it took about five months to court him. And uh, his last two companies that IPO'd, um, but he'd never been a founder of a business. Um, he was the CTO of Salesforce for, oh, he was there for about nine years and was the CTO for the last three years that he was there. And um, when we were, Marco and I were in Vegas at the time and we were trying to raise money there, um, we were getting valuations more in the, you know, one to two million range. 
Um, and the day that Craig joined, the valuations jumped up to the $10 million range. Did you tell um, him that? Did you want him to know he was that valuable before he agreed to how much equity you were going to give him? Or did you test putting his face on the PowerPoint slide and see what the valuation increase would be? I, he didn't need to be told. Yeah. He, he, knew, he knew his market value, and, and he was a party to those discussions. So it yeah. wasn't a... There was no information asymmetry there, yeah. um, nor would I've wanted there to be one. Um, and so, you know, we had already been having some conversations about the equity split, um, but um, those conversations came to a head pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm the CEO of the company, but Craig owns. Um, Don't I tell think- me an exact number because you're getting in trouble. But like, does he own more than you? Oh yeah, he owns significantly yeah. more. Got it. So is, yeah, he, is he the majority more. share? Comp- he's the majority shareholder in the company. No, no, okay. because we've, we've raised four rounds of capital. Got it. How um, much total? Um, we've raised 58.3 million. Got it. Okay, good. So 58.3 million. So, okay. Besides investors, is he the, the he owns the most? Uh, he is the largest common shareholder. Yeah. yeah. He, has, he has a plurality, but not a majority. Got it. Makes good sense. That's a common. And what, so, so you guys have raised all this capital. I mean, how do you, I assume you have good, good economics. You understand what it costs you to go acquire a new hotel, right? At the ACB of 17 K per year. What are you spending to go acquire a new hotel? Um, our payback period, um, is about 14 months right now. Okay. 14. So, so if your average deal size is 17 grand, I can assume you're spending what about 20 grand to acquire a new customer. Somewhere in that range. Is yeah. it super sticky? I mean, I imagine once you're integrated, there's a onboarding, and once they're integrated, is it hard to switch? We we've literally never lost a company, uh, yeah. a customer in five years. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so um, we've lost individual hotels. Yep. Uh, we had a hotel that there was a military coup in a country, and they closed <laughs> the hotel. Um, there was one that was exploded in, you know, Vegas to build a new expansion to the convention center and so forth. But we've actually never lost, uh, uh, a customer only individual properties. Got it. Um, and so uh, it's very unusual for a software company to have that degree of stickiness. Um, I've never found one that did. Well, so let me ask you um, an interesting question about this, right? Because these are tough, these are interesting numbers, especially when you start to extrapolate them, which can be dangerous, but you kind of have to do it, right? So if you know that your churn is so low and right now you're spending 20,000 bucks to go get a hotel chain, I mean, what if your lifetime value is 2 million bucks for that one hotel? Like, how do you know whether to double your CAC or cut it in half by one? How do you make those decisions? Um, we don't know. Um, what I will say is, is that the selling into the lodging market is incredibly difficult. Um, some of it's because of the fragmented value chain that I described earlier. Um, some of it is because it's about as old school of an industry as you can get. Um, that does not embrace technology quickly, although that's beginning to change. And so the the dilemma for us is is that we've experimented with pouring additional cash into additional sales reps or demand gen or other things, and it the the cash gets spent very inefficiently. So that that ratio of sort of CAC to ACV doesn't actually hold. It yeah. becomes diminishing massively returns. less less efficient. And so there's almost this force of nature where it's actually really hard to grow the business faster than it's naturally growing because there are these time periods where a hotel company is looking for new technology, um, either because they have bought one of our incumbents um, and they're stuck in a five-year contract. And you know, no matter how many times you call on them, they can't buy for another three <laughs> years because they have to wait, um, or because they're in the process of doing a massive – um, replatforming of their property management system. And until that's done, they just really can't take on something. I mean, so there's these, there are these sort of fixed impediments to some companies moving quickly. And so what we've learned is we can grow more rapidly by expanding to new geographies, which is why we have offices, I think in, I think we're in seven countries today and we'll soon be in nine countries in terms of physical offices. How many, how many hotels out of curiosity? By the end of this quarter, we should have close to 3,000 hotels. That's amazing. Okay. In, in I think, 98 countries. Now, okay, wait, um, hold on. My math, something in my math is wrong in here because if I take three – or no, maybe it's right. So if I take 3,000 kind of hotels times your $17,000 ACV, what you guys are, a $50 million run rate on average? Um, well, so um, that, that will be contracted, and some of that will be lagging behind integrations. And so we actually don't con- count those as confirmed bookings. 
um, but they're on their way. the integrations are done, right? So we, we have this weird concept. So another idiosyncrasy of our business is that we have this lag of a gross booking, which is then broken up into confirmed bookings and deferred bookings. The deferred bookings can sometimes hang out there for as much as a year Wow. Um, while we work on integrations into their custom in-house systems or new vendors that we haven't worked with before. And so, you know, our current run rate you know, is, you know, I don't usually share the exact numbers, but we're, we're, we're a fraction of, of the number that you just claimed, you know, the, the, the back of the envelope that you did, but we will be there next year. Got it. Got and it. So there's this constant lag where we're basically moving from deferred to, to confirm to confirm this year. And then that's what we claim to investors and our board. And, yep. and, and internally, that's what we talk about is our confirmed bookings. But then on a, on a gross bookings basis, you know, that's the number more that I was quoting. Do you have any, like, when you look at your gross margin, do you have any weird costs that the average software company doesn't have? Or are you looking at like an 85% gross margin, like, like most SaaS companies? We have a larger services organization than most um, because there's a, a pretty significant change management initiative um, that a hotel needs to go through in order to implement um, our software. They so, have to, so you put that above the line as a cog? Uh, we put that above the line as a car. Yeah. Got it. Interesting. And so um, now our, ours is hovering in the mid seventies. So it's, it's still like healthy. Some, it, it's healthy, but but a year ago it was in the thirties. Right. Was so, it re- holy mackerel? What what changes did you make to do, go from thirty percent to seventy five percent gross margin? Um, I mean, it was just the, I think the natural. I mean, we focused on it for one thing. Yeah. Uh, we knew it was important. Um, and so we've done things on the engineering side to make that sort of onboarding and, and training process and configuration process more um, efficient. And then we've also just gotten smarter and, and refined our playbook um, much more than it was. And so the, the way the rhythm kind of worked and the way we staffed up our company is we we staffed up sales pretty quickly globally. Then with about a six month lag, we staffed up our services organization um, pretty quickly Mm -hmm. and we did it in multiple geographies around the world. And that was highly inefficient for a period of time, but we needed to have those teams in place as the sales came in to make sure that we kept our virtually zero percent, you know, churn rate um, and, and get them successful in each of those and get reference customers quickly in those markets. But then as we continue to grow the business, we haven't had it to continue to add and headcount on a linear basis. I mean, That's obviously great. most of it's people. So the technology side for us is very inexpensive. So our, our platform gross margin is north of 95%. Yep. Our blended gross margin, including, you know, the, the onboarding services is where it, it dips down into the seventies. So, you know, we've more than we've just about doubled it, maybe a little more than doubled it in the last 12 months. Yep. And um, we expect it to get into the 80s by next year. So just to be clear, you kind of had to have a fixed cost structure when you launched because you needed to make sure onboarding was efficient and that lifetime values and sticky rates, you know, prevailed to what you want them to be as you're adding new customers with that same fixed cost structure, which is this in the form of salespeople in new geographies. It's becoming more and more efficient over time. That's right. Makes good and sense. And that's also why cash burn over the last 18 months has been more than cut in half and we expect it to get cut in half again. Well, I mean, when you're worse, you're way better than this now. I'm curious though. I mean, have you ever burned more than a million bucks in one, one month? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah, we did it. We did it for a couple of years. How do you sleep? Like, I I mean, that's not a derogatory question, but I'm just curious. How do you sleep when you're like, crap, our bank's going down by a million bucks this, this month. Um, part of it was night and, uh, naivete at one point. I thought um, you were going to say drugs. (laughs) Um, no, I've actually tried really hard to avoid, I mean, I, I travel to like 30 countries a year. So I am constantly dealing with jet lag and I try really hard not to, I mean, I know you were joking, but like to not take drugs to sleep has actually been something that's been a definitive choice. Have you experimented with nootropics? I have, I've, I've kind of done it all. Um, in the end, I just find that sometimes you're just tired. Yeah. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and usually I'm an easy sleeper. And so it's, it, to me, it's about diet, exercise, mindfulness, um, and, uh, and then the sleep, you know, falls in line That's great. When, when the other things are balanced. But anyway, to get back to your question. So, I mean, for a long time, I was just being told by the, so the, the types of investors we have, um, which there's good and bad of the investors that we have, where we've got people like Excel partners, <laughs> uh, battery ventures, Trinity altimeter, um, benchmark capital was in our, our first couple rounds. Um, 
they uh, they've got very high expectations. They've earned their reputations because of their ability to pick, you know, not just you know doubles or triples, but home run companies. And they do pattern recognition where they say the businesses that have become billion dollar businesses end up burning huge amounts of cash for a long time. Yeah. Um, and they they reassured me that it was normal <laughs> and yep. that as long as I kept hitting my milestones in terms of product market fit and then growth, that the capital would always be there. Yep. Now that's changed. So back in 2015, when we raised our last round, um, which was how much uh, we raised 30 million um, in uh, our first closing was August 1st of 2015. And then we did a secondary closing um, in October. Okay. Um, for some smaller investors to come in that were more strategic. And so Q3 of 2015 uh, was just the tail end of a period when valuations of growth tech companies were inversely correlated with cash burn. The more you burned, the higher you were valued because there was almost an exclusive focus on growth. Um, now it's about 50-50. It's about 50% on growth, 50% on cash burn. And so back when I raised money, it was true that – the burn just didn't really matter at all as long as you were hitting, you know, the north of 100% bookings growth, which we which we were comfortably doing. Year um, over year. Uh, year over year, yeah. yeah. And uh, now the world has changed, and cash burn is more important, which actually makes sense. That's you guys, probably you guys aren't break even yet, though, right? No, we're not. You can so, because of how much you raised. You, you have to spend it somehow, right? Well— I, yes, that's that tends. That was the old mentality. I, but, I but how do you do that though? You can't. You can't raise fifty million bucks and be break even unless it just sits in your on your balance sheet and, and does nothing. I, I would be happy to have a war chest sitting on my balance sheet. Yeah, but uh, what would the VC still. say at the board meeting? They say, "What are you doing with our cash? It's sitting here. You don't know how to use it. Give us it back." Uh, in 2015, that's what they would say. In 2017, that's not what they'd be saying. It's funny. All right, last, they, few, they, last, be cheering. last few questions here. We got to wrap up. Uh, what's your team size? Uh, we're at 105 people right now. And where's uh, where's the home base? Headquartered in San Francisco, but our biggest office is Vegas. Many of you know I am buying companies that I really, really like, and there's no quicker way for me to get to the bottom of what is happening on that website than using this tool called NathanLaka.com forward slash hot jar, H-O-T-J-A-R. It basically will give me a recording, okay? When anybody lands on the website, it'll give me a recording of where the viewer is scrolling and obviously does the basic stuff like heat maps too, but I learn so much about where the users are scrolling and clicking on my site using that tool. It helps me increase conversion rates, make more money, and grow those businesses faster. And we'll have to see what happens with those businesses, but I'm buying them. I'm buying them very quick, and I'm using NathanLaka.com forward slash Hotjar for all of my website analytics. You can too. I work with them. It's totally free. You can go to NathanLaka.com forward slash Hotjar. No credit card required. Again, use it as much as you want. NathanLaka.com forward slash Hotjar. I'll see you there. Okay, very cool. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, I still like Crossing the Chasm, even though it's out of favor. That's good. Hey, listen, Jeffrey Moore, he hit it. Beautiful orange cover. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Um, I've been learning a lot from a friend of mine, uh, Matthew Prince, uh, who runs uh, Cloudflare. Number three, is there a favorite online tool you have, like Acuity Scheduling? Um, no. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, a year ago, I would have said four and a half, and now I'm trying to get seven. Okay, but what do you get? Sorry, I try to get eight, and I get seven. Got it. And what's your current situation? Married, single, do you have kids? Um, divorced with kids. Okay, how many kiddos? Three. Three. All right. And how old are you? 39. All right. Almost 40. Nice. Good. Hey, happy, happy early birthday. Last question. Take us back 19 years. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Um, I, I wish that I had believed that it was okay for me to be happy back then. I, I had a pretty unhappy 20s. And um, I've kind of come into my own skin more in the last several years. Um, but um, I think I could have better served myself. There you go. Um, 
There you guys have it. He would have given himself permission again to be happy and really go all in on life. Based off how his interview went, I think he's going all in. You guys heard it with Duetto. They launched in 2012, three co-founders, now 105 people, helping hotels and specifically hotel locations better optimize their pricing. They raised $51 million, serving over 3,000 individual hotel locations, paying on average 17 grand per year. So they will very soon be doing about a $50 million run rate, 75% gross margin, which they've really like tripled uh, over the recent few which is incredible how they how they work that fixed cost structure to drive more growth and, and bring the margin up over time. Uh, additionally, again, spending about twenty thousand bucks on CAC, so super healthy payback period. About well, healthy payback period at about fourteen months again, based out there in San Francisco and Vegas. Patrick, thank you for taking us to the top. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, go back and listen to Sunil yesterday. His mobile analytics company went from zero to four million dollars in revenue in under twelve months. How do you do it? 